This lecture is part of an online course on commutative algebra and will be about Hilbert's theorem on finite generation of algebras of invariance. So what we're going to do is we're going to suppose G is a finite group acting on a finite dimensional vector space Um, over a field, which we will call K, of characteristic zero. Then we will show that the algebra of invariance of G is finitely generated And um, as we said, there were several different meanings of finitely generated. So this means as a K algebra. And we just recall the invariants are just the polynomials on K fixed by the action of G. Um, so, um, Let's look at the proof of this. Um, first of all, uh, suppose the vector space is dimension n, then we've got the algebra of all polynomials is just a, is just a um, polynomial ring kx1 up to xn. Here, n is just the dimension of our vector space v. And a key point of this is that this is graded. What this means is we can give each xi degree one, and then every monomial has some degree. So x1 to the n1, x2 to the n2, and so on has degree um, n1 plus n2, and so on. So um, we can write, um, uh, let's call this ring r. We can write r as a direct sum r0 plus r1 plus R2 and so on, where Ri are the things of degree I. So R0 is just K and R1 is spanned by X1 up to Xn. And um, graded rings are generally easy to work with because you can often prove things by induction. You, 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 you start at degree naught and work your way up by induction. And this is, this is what we will do in order to prove Hilbert's theorem. So, so let's write I for the subalgebra of invariance. And I is also graded, so we can write I is equal to I naught plus I one plus I two and so on. Um, and then we're gonna put J to be the ideal of R generated by I1, I2, and so on. And you should notice here that we, that there is no I0. In fact, I0 contains the element one. So the ideal generated by I0 would just be the, the whole polynomial ring. So, so we're, we're only taking these elements in order to define the ideal J. And then J can then be written as J1 plus J2 plus J3 and so on. It's, so it's graded as well. And of course, there's no J0 or rather J0 is equal to zero. So um, now we notice that J is a finitely generated ideal by the Hilbert's basis theorem. And suppose it's generated by, by elements, um, say, A1, A2, up to AK. And we can take the AIs to be homogeneous. Um, so we want to show that A1 and so on generate um, the algebra 
I. And now you need to distinguish very carefully between generating something as an algebra um, and generating something as an ideal. So, so, that, so they generate the module or ideal I, uh, sorry, not, not J. Um, so that means every element in J is a linear combination of the AI with coefficients in R, whereas generating I as an algebra means everything in I is a polynomial in the A's with coefficients in K. So, so here A is an algebra over K, and this is an ideal of um, R. And in general, there's no reason why if you've got a subring I and why the generators of J should be generators of I. So, so let's look at the following example, um, which we've actually had before. So let's write out the basis for the elements as usual. So we've got Y, Y squared, Y cubed, X, Y, X, X squared, Y. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take J, uh, let's, no, let's define I first, so I, is going to be the subalgebra generated by these things here. And now you can see the ideal J is generated by all the things of degree greater than one. So this is the ideal J. And the ideal J is generated by X. But does not generate the algebra i. In fact, the algebra i, of course, is not even finitely generated, as, as we saw earlier. So, so um, for general rings, we can't prove that the, ri that, that, that the ring is finitely generated as an algebra by, by fiddling around with some finitely generated ideal. And the, 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 however, we're not working with a with an arbitrary subring of polynomials. We're working with a with a ring of invariants. So we need to know what extra property does the ring of invariants have? Um, so, and the answer is, it has a Reynolds operator. which is indicated by rho. This is a Greek letter rho for Reynolds, not a, not, a, not a letter P. And the Reynolds operator is very easy. Reynolds operator applied to a polynomial is the average of F under the group G. And we can define the average to be sum over all elements of G, of G applied to F. And then we have to divide by the order of G. And now this is where we are using the two assumptions we made. In order to sum over G, we need to use the fact that G is finite. And in order to divide by the order of G, we um, need K to be of characteristic zero. Um, or at least the characteristic of K does not divide the order of G. So this proof would also work for a um, if, if the field had characteristic P greater than naught, provided P didn't divide the order of G. Um, so let's see what properties this Reynolds operator has. So properties of rho. First of all, rho of one is equal to one. Kind of completely trivial. Um, next, rho of F G is not equal to rho of F rho of G in general. Rho is not a homomorphism of rings. I mean, there's no reason why it should be. You can check this easily for G being of order two. However, rho of F G is equal to F times rho of G if F is fixed by the group G. Again, that's almost um, trivial from this. Uh, I see I've been using G for a polynomial as well as a group element, but um, um, I guess you'll just have to cope with that. 
Um, and from this, it follows that rho of f is equal to f if f is fixed by g. And these are the two properties of the Reynolds operator we're going to use. You can rephrase them as follows. So we've got a, um, a map from the ring I to the ring R. So I is a subring of R. So we have this exact sequence. And you can think of all of these as being I modules. And the Reynolds operator kind of goes back the other way. So rho is a homomorphism of I modules from R to I. And furthermore, it splits this exact sequence. So um, we can write R is equal to I plus the kernel of rho, um, again, the, where, where we're considering both sides as I modules. So um, it's the fact that this sequence splits, which is the, is the key to proving Hilbert's theorem. Well, now that we've done introduced the Reynolds operator and we've got Hilbert's basis theorem, um, we can now finish off the proof of Hilbert's theorem very easily. So we're now proved by induction on the degree that A1, A2 generate I as a K algebra. So we pick F in I with degree of F is greater than naught, and we're going to use induction on the degree of F. And we can put F is equal to um, a1, C1, plus A2, C2, and so on, where Ci is in R because F is in the ideal J and the Ai generates the ideal J. Well, there's no particular reason why the Cis should be invariant yet. But what we do is we now apply rho. So we get F equals rho of f because f is fixed by i. So it's fixed by g. And this is equal to rho of a1 c1 plus rho of a2 c2 and so on, which is equal to a1 rho of c1 plus a2 rho of c2 and so on because um, all the AI are fixed by G. Um, and now um, all the elements rho of CI are in I because if you make anything invariant under G, then it's obviously fixed by G. So um, the degree of CI is less than the degree of f because the degree of a i is greater than zero. So by induction, c i is in the algebra generated by a1, a2, and so on. Well, now all the c i's are in the algebra generated by the a's and the, um, sorry, the row of c i's are in the algebra generated by the a's. So, um, so this expression here is in I. So we've shown that F, so not in I, in the algebra generated by A1, but by the A's. So we've shown by induction that anything in I is in the algebra generated by the um, generators AI. So this completes the proof of Hilbert's theorem that the Algebra of invariance of a finite group in characteristic zero is finitely generated. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the, the, the background for this. First of all, you can ask the question, who was Reynolds? And there was 
if you try looking for some guy Reynolds working in invariant theory, you won't find anybody. That's because Reynolds didn't work in invariant theory. He actually worked in fluid dynamics of all things. Um, you may have heard of the Reynolds number of a fluids flow. Um, that's the same Reynolds. Um, he invented Reynolds number as well as Reynolds operator. Um, his Reynolds operator was originally the following. Um, suppose you take a fluid flow varying in time. Well, that's incredibly complicated. So what Reynolds did was he said, well, let's replace the fluid flow at each point by its average over time. So he was just looking at the average flow of a fluid over time. And you see what's happening is you've got a group of time translations. And what you're really doing is replacing the fluid flow by the average fluid flow over over time. So, so what Reynolds was doing was he was taking the average over the group of time translations. And the group, the, the, the term Reynolds operator has been also used to mean taking the average over any other group. Um, well, um, Hilbert didn't actually just do the case of um, finite groups. He also um, proved it for groups like um, SLN over the complex numbers. So um, I just want to say how you can extend Hilbert's result to this more general case. Um, first of all, the proof above works equally well for compact groups. And the point about compact groups is we can integrate over them. Well, you can try integrating over non-compact groups like the reals, but there's actually no guarantee your integrals converge. Um, in fact, Reynolds' operation of integrating over over time isn't really, it's not entirely clear that it's well defined. And whether or not you can take the average of a bounded continuous function over the reals is a kind of tricky question. Um, and for groups like SLN of C, taking the average of a bounded function is an extremely dubious operation. Um, anyway, for compact groups, there's no problem because you can just integrate continuous functions over them. So we can define rho of f to be the integral over all g of g of f. And here we divide by the, um, this will be the volume of g. And the point is that compact groups are finite volume. Non-compact groups, you, even if you do integrate over them, the volume is infinite. So if you divide by the volume, you just get zero. Um, so, well, that's fine, but the problem is SLN of C is not compact. So that doesn't work directly. But now we can use a rather cunning idea known as Vile's Unitarian trick. So the point is the group SUN, the special unitary group, is compact. So Hilbert's theorem applies to the special unitary group. And now we look at the following picture. We've got the special unitary group, and this is contained in the special linear group over the complex numbers, which also contains the special linear group over the reals. And these groups all have Lie algebras. So, so, so this has the special unitary group of Lie algebras, and this is contained in the Lie algebra SLN of C, which are just matrices of trace equal to zero. And this contains the Lie algebra SLN of R, which again is just matrices of trace zero. And if you go to a course on Lie groups, you know that finite dimensional representations of a special unitary group are very similar to finite dimensional representations of the Lie algebra. So um, here we have the representations are similar in finite dimensions. And again, here, the representations of these are more or less the same as the representations of these in finite dimensions. Um, that's generally true. Representation, finite dimensional representations of the Lie algebra correspond to finite dimensional representations of the Lie group if the Lie group is simply connected. 
Now, actually, the special linear group over the reals isn't simply connected, but it's close enough that finite dimensional representations of these two basically correspond. And when we're doing representation theory, we're sort of fitting around with finite dimensional representations of these groups here. Um, and now, although the Lie algebras aren't the same, they're actually very similar because SLN of C is isomorphic to SLN of R tensored with the complex numbers. And it's also isomorphic to SUN of R tensored with the complex numbers. So although these two real Lie algebras are not the same, they do become the same if you, if you tensor them over with the complex numbers. And what this means is that the finite dimensional representations, in fact, the, 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 the complex representations of these two algebras are the same because their complexifications happen to be isomorphic. So we see that finite dimensional representations of this group are really the same as finite dimensional representations of this group, because we can just go from there and then jump across to there and then go up to there. Now, this group has a Reynolds operator. And what this means is that finite dimensional representations of this group do, in fact, have a Reynolds operator. So we can take the Reynolds operator um, of this group here and just transfer it to there and then transfer it to there and transfer it to there. And in fact, this group does have a Reynolds operator for finite dimensional representations. And so we can, Hilbert's theorem goes through. Um, I should have a warning that for infinite dimensional representations, this thing breaks down completely. And the infinite dimensional representations of these two groups really have very little to do with each other. The reason why it breaks down is that to go from groups to Lie algebras, you need to use an exponential map. Um, you can just take the exponential series applied to a matrix, and that works fine. But the trouble is, if you try the exponential map for an infinite dimensional linear transformation, um, it just doesn't converge in general. And the there is still a relation between representations of the Lie group and the Lie algebra, but it's much, much more subtle. And um, um, in particular, for example, if you look at unitary representations of these groups, all irreducible unitary representations of this are finite, whereas almost all irreducible unitary representations of this group are infinite. So in infinite dimensions, these two groups have very little to do with each other. Um, so, um, this, uh, this proof we've given, as we've said, works for fields of characteristic zero. Um, next lecture, we will discuss what happens for fields of characteristic greater than zero. Um, and Emmy Nurter managed to show that quite a lot of Hilbert's proof would go through for fields of characteristic greater than zero, only we need to use um, more commutative algebra because we uh, can't make use of the Reynolds operator.